Hello, everyone. This is Healthcare IT Live, and this is Tim Cook. Today, our guest is Dr. Edward Shortliff. Dr. Shortliff is clinical professor of bioinformatics at biomedical informatics at Arizona State University, and he also serves as senior advisor to the executive uh, vice provost for health solutions. He's based in New York City, also is a scholar in residence at New York Academy of Medicine and an adjunct professor of biomedical informatics at Columbia University. From 2009 till April of 2012, he's president and CEO of the American Medical Informatics Association. Dr. Shortliff, after receiving an AB in applied mathematics from Harvard in 1970, he moved to Stanford University where he was awarded a PhD in medical information sciences in 1975 and an MD in 1976. He was a principal developer of probably one of the first uh, real expert systems in healthcare known as Mycin, and uh, he worked on that from 1973 to 1975. Dr. Shortliff, welcome to Healthcare IT Live. Thank you, happy to be here. Great, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your history of uh, entering medical informatics and uh, what brought you to healthcare in general from the field of mathematics? <laughs> Well, I'm just gray enough that by the time I went to college, I'd never had laid hands on a on a computer. That was in the uh, mid '60s, and so uh, I went thinking I was going to go to medical school, uh, planning to be a physician, and then discovered computer science in in while well, I was at university there. Uh, this was at Harvard College up in Boston, uh, and gradually began to realize I had a big choice to make between computer science and and medicine, and I was advised to go talk to some folks at Massachusetts General Hospital who were combining the two. I got very excited about the uh, opportunity to do both, and then I started to look for medical schools that would let somebody do something that weird in about 1960 <laughs> uh, Ended up going to Stanford, which was one of the most uh, flexible curricula for medical students in those days. So uh, it was serendipitous, but uh, became, uh, uh, by the way, there was no computer science major at, at, at Harvard in those days, so applied math was what you did if you were interested in computers. Okay. Okay, great. Well, you know, certainly uh, the first time I think I saw your name was when I ran across Mycin, and I say ran across because uh, artificial intelligence and then healthcare later became, you know, it's always something I've been interested in since uh, the 80s, I guess. and. Uh, Mycin kind of set a, a, a stake in the ground for um, how to develop uh, AI or, or expert systems in healthcare. Can you tell us a little bit about that process? Uh, well, you know, there was already work on artificial intelligence going on at Stanford that uh, I became involved in the group that did that kind of work. Uh, in the computer science department. There's a, there's a system you might have heard of from that era called Dendral, which tried to uh, capture the knowledge of uh, organic chemists who knew how to read uh, uh, mass spectra in order to determine the structure of organic compounds. Uh, and that was a very interesting program. It didn't, it didn't have an interactive capability, but it, it, it did capture a lot of knowledge of, from chemists and then had a kind of rule-based approach to uh, uh, trying to simulate the behavior of chemists in interpreting mass spectra. Uh, I came in as a medical student. I was interested in doing something more clinical. Uh, and as we began to try to adapt some of those early ideas from Dendral to be used in, uh, in medicine, uh, the notion of the Mycin program evolved from that. And it was a collaborative effort. It involved the computer science department. Me as kind of the prime mover as a student working on a PhD while I was in med school. Uh, and then uh, infectious disease experts from, uh, from the medical school who helped us with uh, the knowledge. And this notion of collaborating between medical people and computer scientists, having bridge people that kind of understood both, uh, I think was kind of emerging in that era. And, and to this day, we know that's an important concept uh, for uh, applied uh, clinical informatics projects. Right. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about MySense? What kind of machines did it run on? What was your, your interface to, you know, because now we, we're so... Uh, so familiar with directly interacting with these machines and I can imagine at that time it was kind of a thing you went to go do not something that was interactive. 
Well, so the time period uh, that I worked on Meissen was from about 1971 uh, until I left to go do my house staff training in 1976. The dissertation was finished in 75, so it was about a five-year period. And by the end of that period, we actually had grant funding that allowed the work to continue while I was uh, training. Um, so I would say the Meissen project probably lasted until about 1979 with grant funding in the later years. The early years, no grant funding, but we did have access to a, a remarkable mainframe computer that was made available under NIH funding and was the first non-military machine on the ARPA network in those days. Uh, it was shared around the country using the ARPA network, and all AI and medicine research pretty much used that one machine. It was called the SUMEX AIM computer, it stood for Stanford University Medical Experimental Computer, S-U-M-E-X. Uh, and we uh, initially had many other people in the United States using it over the ARPANET and later uh, quite a few international users all working on medically related problems. Uh, so that was the machine we used, big time sharing machine. It was not an IBM 360 or something. It was actually a Digital Equipment Corporation, initially DEC 10, later a DEC 20. Uh, but time shared and obviously by today's standards, uh, big and ponderous uh, <laughs> by my by our modern criteria, but it's amazing what you could do with it and how many people you could have running on it at one time uh, as we did in those days. Right. And following on from Meissen, um, where, you know, um, where have you gone in, have you followed the, the clinical decision support uh, field much or other aspects because there's lots of uh, tentacles to health informatics in general and we'll get into that in a little bit a little bit more detail later as well but could you tell us a little bit more about your career since then and led you up into the American Medical Informatics Association leadership sure well of course it's a convoluted story but I'll try to make it quick basically uh, when I finished my house staff training a residency in internal medicine I joined the faculty in the Department of Medicine at Stanford I had done some of my house staff training back in Boston, but then returned uh, to Stanford. And then I was at Stanford on the faculty from 1979 to 2000, so 21 years on the faculty. Uh, during that time, I continued to work on uh, artificial intelligence and medicine, clinical decision support. Uh, our next big project was in uh, cancer chemotherapy. It was known as the Onkison system. And uh, although it had rule-based components rather like Meissen, it was more complicated, a little harder to teach. I think one of the reasons Meissen's well-known is because it's quite easy to teach using it about the rule concepts of rule-based uh, decision support. Uh, Onkison uh, was uh, not only uh, an effort to separate process knowledge from inferential knowledge, which are two important uh, components of expertise, uh, but it also began our very first experimentation with graphical user interfaces. And now, uh, it was in the late 70s, early 1980s. You probably know about when PCs and Macs began to appear. And that's not what we used. We used uh, uh, products from Xerox Corporation called uh, Xerox Lisp machines. They were developed primarily to run an artificial intelligence language. They had wonderful. Uh, graphical user interface that you all heard about how those interfaces out of Xerox Park uh, inspired Steve Jobs and Macintosh only a few years later. Uh, but I would say we were ending up doing, although we were doing AI and decision support work, we were also doing a lot of human computer interaction work in those days while we began to develop uh, expertise in the, uh, in the use of the graphical interface medical application. Uh, and then we did uh, uh, subsequent work in AIDS therapy, uh, actually implementing it in a big AIDS clinic uh, north of uh, the Stanford campus. Um, and then by the mid-90s had begun to work on the development of standards for the encoding of clinical practice guidelines uh, so that they could be shared, sort of like the art and syntax had done for alerts and rules. Uh, we developed something called GLIF for the guideline interchange format. Uh, that was funded by the National Library of Medicine, and I, even after I left uh, uh, Stanford and went to Columbia, we continued to work on that project. It was called the InterMed Project. So 
uh, kind of in a nutshell, I continued pretty much to do decision support, but always kind of uh, moving to the next uh, kind of technology uh, and fixing standards issues and use of the internet. Uh, and I must say, I think one of the lessons of the early work in clinical decision support was that standalone uh, decision support programs that you went to when you needed help was the model that Mycin and Ernest and some of the other early programs pursued was not a particularly reasonable model once you really understood the way physicians worked and uh, the context in which they were likely to use this support. So much of the later work, starting with Onkison, uh, was really an effort to integrate uh, decision support into workflow and into the medical record, uh, which continues to be, I think, uh, the way we see we have to do it today through either uh, physician order entry or other provider order entry uh, or integrated tightly with the electronic health record. Right. I think that continues to be the big challenge. Um, how big a role do you think that the the infrastructure of these uh, clinical practice systems, I don't want to say EMR or EHR because those terms get all muddied up together, but the, the actual patient record system, the uh, to me, that the, the semantics capture of these is great for one system, and, and all these are very well-designed systems, but when it comes to sharing data between the various systems, the semantics seem to get lost. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, I think we've recognized the, the issue of standards beyond HL7, uh, which is simply the transport standard, but, uh, you know, all the, uh, the semantic standards uh, as being important to true data integration and our, our kind of vision of uh, learning from, from our experience across multiple institutions. Uh, most public health applications depend on it as well. I would say we were talking about standards 20 years ago and, and the need to really address standards beyond uh, the, the simple transport uh, uh, issues of HL7. HL7 as an organization has embraced many other kinds of standards subsequently, as you know. Uh, but it did start out focusing just on that seventh level of the ISO seven level, level uh, networking model. Um, so I mentioned Glyph. I mean, Glyph was an effort to develop a standard, and the reason we did it as a multi-institutional project was we figured that no single institution would ever have credibility trying to propose a standard, and that we needed to do something that had buy-in uh, from multiple organizations and institutions. And, uh, so it, we did have uh, quite a large number of collaborators on that project from different parts of the country. Um, and uh, Glyph is still um, a subject of some study and it's influenced the way subsequent discussions of the encoding of guidelines should proceed. There are other uh, subsequent models like Proforma and, uh, and the um, well, I, I won't go into all that. We could get sidelined on that subject, but but that's a standards issue that's aimed at trying to allow more interoperability of uh, of knowledge among systems, so different vendors could implement guidelines, even if they had value-added differences between their products, they could still use the same knowledge bases. Um, also, recognizing the need for custom tailoring knowledge from institution to institution, and the importance of buy-in by the practitioners before you before you turn loose uh, any kind of decision support. Sure. I, uh, I have just a little bit of experience with Glyph, and I think that uh, probably if it was, if that project was given some more funding to carry on uh, into the future, I believe that, you know, it'd be a very, very important project to, uh, to mature the guideline encoding process. Uh, I'd really love to see that happen myself. I know Pro forma is supposedly very good, but its lack of openness, I think, is an obstacle to... Uh, well, that's true. It became part of a commercial activity yeah. out of the UK, as you probably know. Uh, so uh, Glyph is still um, influencing this area, whereas although we, the group that had developed it, uh, NLM had no more funding for it, and we, we really couldn't secure a way to keep it going as an academic venture. We tried hard to get it picked up by HL7 and their decision support group or something like that. I know it certainly influenced my, my thinking and stuff as far as the, the depth of the semantics that need to be captured in healthcare information. Um, uh, another subject we, we mentioned earlier 
Um, when you talk about informatics in healthcare, you you tend to get people that want to use terms and they seem to kind of get mixed and muddled up together. Can you talk a little bit about bioinformatics and health informatics and medical informatics? And are these separate disciplines? Are they crossovers? Does a person need to be multidisciplinary in those? Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Let me start with a little bit of context here. Um, I'm a uh, an educator as much as anything and I spent a lot of time creating designing and running graduate programs and thinking about what you need to know in order to be effective in this field uh, so uh, it became clear to me that even potential students were very confused about the field they heard too many different names referring to it and um, a big transformation occurred in the 1990s I would say that prior to 1990 uh, to the extent that we had an agreed upon name for the field, it was medical informatics. Okay. Right. Um, that was still only a decade old name. When I was, uh, you heard, my degree was in medical information sciences because we didn't have uh, right. the name medical informatics yet in those days. Um, but by, uh, by 1990, things started to change because of the Human Genome Project and the rapid recognition in the life science world that you couldn't do biological science anymore without computers and you needed to develop expertise in the area and a lot of people with wet bench labs uh, were trying to find people that knew something about computers to work in their labs we saw this emergence of a field that they in the biology world tended to call computational biology but then there were people in informatics who started to work on these same genetic and, and uh, biological problems and they tended to choose the name bioinformatics to describe what they were doing in the molecular biology and genetics area. Um, it turned out we could see many examples of the same informatics techniques that had been used in the clinical world being practically important uh, in uh, the biological world and yet I saw the academic programs around this country and to a certain extent I think this happened everywhere we began to see separate biologically oriented programs separate from the clinical ones not learn not sharing their knowledge uh, and this was especially pertinent for example the best example I can think of is the development of the gene ontology which was done by folks who literally paid no attention to all the work on terminology that had been done in the clinical world for some years uh, and I think made many of the same mistakes initially that we had learned about and that uh, collaboration with or simply reading the literature from the clinical world would have helped them uh, uh, avoid some of those problems so I personally as the leader of an academic group <laughs> did not want to see the biological informatics separated from the more clinical informatics uh, and so and yet it was clear that people who were really focused on biological applications did not like the idea of being in a unit that was called medical informatics it sounded too much like it was about doctors in the clinical world uh, and I think by about 2000 2001 our program and most programs in an effort to really bridge the entire range from molecular biology all the way up to clinical and public health informatics uh, began to use the, the the phrase biomedical informatics to refer to the field. This also seemed to help diffuse some of the concerns of the nursing community and other health professional communities who had hated medical informatics because it didn't seem to include other health professions besides doctors uh, in spite of the fact that I think people in medical informatics groups often did include nurses and dentists and other health professionals in their groups the word medical is, is just was not well accepted in the nursing community so biomedical was somehow a little more acceptable um, and we now use that word and I must say I speak on behalf of Amia now too because Amia has actually published its standards for this we now use biomedical informatics as the sole name for the discipline the methods the techniques the theories uh, the core science of our field uh, now then you may say well then what are all those other phrases what are all those other terms and as you've gathered bioinformatics is the application of biomedical informatics to molecular and uh, cellular problems and issues uh, we have imaging informatics 
which is more the application of biomedical informatics in areas related to tissue and organ systems. It tends to be about visualization, and that's why it's often called imaging informatics. It may be called structural informatics. It has a lot of anatomy in it, uh, pathology, hematology, dermatology, the visually oriented sciences of, of uh, biomedicine. Clinical informatics, then, is the word that we're now using consistently to refer to the care of individual patients. Not medical informatics, clinical informatics. Nurses are happy to be called clinical informatics people, uh, as are dentists and doctors and, and, and all other health professionals uh, in the patient care setting. And then, of course, public health and public health informatics. So we got these four big categories, bioinformatics, imaging informatics, clinical informatics, and public health informatics. Um, and, I, and, and now what we're doing is using clinical informatics as an umbrella term uh, for the various professions underneath. So nursing informatics is part of clinical informatics. Medical informatics, by which we mean doctors and disease, is part of clinical informatics. Uh, dental informatics, veterinary informatics, they're all or, whole organism uh, related. And then finally, what's, what about this phrase, health informatics? Uh, is it a synonym for biomedical informatics? So I don't think so. And uh, Amy has gone on record as saying that's not the same thing. We use health informatics to describe the applied research and practice of clinical and public health informatics. And if you look around the world at people that do health informatics, they tend not to be doing fundamental research that it's always often in global health settings, or but it's clinical or public health in its focus. And so, and by the way, if you call a department a department of health informatics, you will not get any bioinformatics people to join that department. Hmm. Okay. Same so, thing. but biomedical informatics, we have lots of bioinformaticians in biomedical informatics departments, and they yeah. collaborate with and work with people that are doing clinical work because they share. You know, data mining is a method across that entire spectrum. Why, why separate these people around their application domain? Yeah. Well, I, my personal opinion is that none of them should be separated completely. It, it's, it's too important, the crossovers between them are too important for them to work in isolation. And I do see, uh, particularly in certain standards organization, that they seem to be very focused on one of those domains as opposed to a, a larger umbrella type bit of work. Well, I hope it's clear from how I describe the terms that I view them all part of biomedical informatics and its application. Yeah. Okay, everything, all those terms, bioinformatics, yeah. health informatics, nursing informatics, they're all in there. And there, it's not pejorative to use one of the other terms, but you are talking about some subtopic within yeah. biomedical informatics and its application. I, I I tend to agree with the I had not read the the definitions that had come out of them uh, for these, but I certainly agree with your explanation of them. I, I think that they're you know uh, apparently several people spend a lot of time in uh, in developing those uh, those definitions based on what's going on in the fields. They were published last year in Jamia, so you can look up the paper yeah. and look. Yeah. everything I just said is consistent with that article. I, I'm sure it is. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we talked a bit about the fact that you're an educator and, you know, as well as an informatician uh, and, and everything. Um, you have a textbook out that's been out for some time, and uh, I understand you have a new edition coming out, or it's already out. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, it's not already out, but uh, it's done. Uh, we're about to ship it off to the publisher. Hopefully it'll be out in time for the AMIA meeting in the fall. Uh, although production is going to be uh, complicated because it's getting to be a really big book. Uh, if you know the book, uh, it's it, this will be its fourth edition. It came out first in 1990. The first two editions were called Medical Informatics, and for reasons I've just described, the third and now the fourth are called Biomedical Informatics. Okay. Uh, the uh, you know the there were 10 years, 1990 to 2000, during which we uh, finally realized we had to do a new edition and uh, for example and this this is just the problem with our field although it's an exciting part of our field there was uh, essentially no mention of the internet in the 1990 edition and by 2000 it was in every chapter in the book um, 
And between 2000 and 2006, there were huge changes, most wireless and mobility and things like that all came along in that period. And then the health policy changes in the last six years, uh, really, the, uh, and, you know, the rollout of meaningful use and all that kind of stuff has really kind of required us uh, to uh, to do a, another edition now. So the book's been pretty much totally rewritten. There are several new chapters. There are a lot of new authors this time. Believe it or not, some of the authors finally retired <laughs> from the earlier versions, and it was time to, to bring in younger people to, uh, to take over those chapters. So uh, it'll look pretty fresh, but the third edition was about a thousand pages, and, and we've added four or five chapters, so I think it's going to be pretty big. Yeah, you'll start having to break it up into two volumes pretty soon. Uh, we'll we'll certainly very hard not to do that, yeah. but uh, you can change form factors of books and things like that to make it so it'll fit into one volume. So that's probably what will happen. Yeah, great. Well, we look forward to that coming out. I guess it'll be available at all your popular book distributors like Amazon. And Oh yeah, yeah. In the and, time. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll look forward to that. Well, um, we want to. Uh, we're almost at the the half hour mark, and we usually yes. open it up for questions from the panel. Sure. So, so, Luciana, Jean, anyone have any questions? Yes, Luciana. Questions. Looks like no. she, doesn't have, she doesn't have a microphone, maybe. <laughs> oh, okay. She's speechless. That's unusual. <laughs> Joan, uh, welcome to the your first hangout. Do you have any questions for Dr. Shortlet? Okay. Now I can't talk. <clears throat> oh. oh, okay. <laughs> May I? Yes. Well, I am very happy to be here again. It was a delight to meet Professor Shortliff and um, myself. Uh, something about myself. I, I, I work here in Brazil in the Department of Health Information Technology of a Medicine College in a Brazilian university. And um, everything that was covered in this in this panel was it was my it was my daily life, and so it was very interesting for me. But I still have still have some questions because I provide education in health informatics, and I I do research in decision support systems as well. So I think that. Um, uh, I have a lot of respect for for you, Professor Shortliff, and um, I think that I am I am a new generation, and we would like to follow uh, your lead. But um, I would like to to start talking a little bit about education because this is something that really concerns me: the fact that. Um, Health informatics is still a very marginal uh, subject in medicine colleges and other health science colleges. Usually, it's something like in undergrad, it's something like 30 hours, you know, one or two credits somewhere. Usually, at the first or the second year, the students still get confused between health informatics and biostatistics. It's confusing for him. The curriculums need to be updated. This is the situation that we're living. And, uh, but, okay, so here we are talking about what is the traditional education. But working in my projects, I feel the need to have somebody in the middle. Uh, not a computer scientist, not a physician. I need both because all those projects are multidisciplinary. But actually, I feel the need for somebody in the middle that can do the translation because the ad hoc interaction between computer scientists and clinical physicians is very difficult. 
um, their vocabulary is different, and, and even the thought process is different. And um, sometimes I have the impression that my colleagues, physicians, they want us to read their minds. And so maybe in the next century we will have something like a helmet that is a mind reader that generates immediately the applications that they need. Because medicine is a liberal, um, is, a, is liberal work, so which means that each doctor thinks about the same concept, they think slightly different. And this is something that is a challenge, for instance, for the development of decision support systems. And we had Heather Leslie um, um, some weeks ago in this show, and she sent me a very, a, a very good and detailed document about how Australia is thinking the curriculum for, for, for health informatics. And it's very interesting because actually it's something like complementary. So somebody uh, that comes from the computer science will have to who have to complete some education in this field, and physicians will have to complete their education in other subjects, and so on for for each type of of profession. So I think that this is important, but I am not sure that that um, yet covers the need that we need for the for a good communication between computer scientists and uh, um, healthcare. Um, professionals. So I would like to hear a little bit more about your ideas on how to solve this this educational gap. Okay, that was actually, just I'll interject just a moment, that was actually Heather Green and uh, she was mm. referring to the work that they've done in EMEA. In EMEA, I see, yes, yeah. okay. Um, well, Luciana, I see an MD, PhD after your name. So you are trained in medicine as well as in computer science. Is that what that means? Yeah. I am a physician, and I had to uh, self-educate in, in health informatics because the options here in Brazil are 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 limited. Uh, so actually, my PhD is in epidemiology. Yeah, I understand. Okay. That's not so uncommon for people to have their PhDs in other fields, but to basically be doing informatics for for what their uh, actual time commitment is. Well, look, um, I mean, what you've just described has been the story of my life for 40 years. Okay, I've always been in medical schools, and I've always been aware of precisely the disconnects that you're describing. Uh, in fact, one can argue one of the very best reasons for having graduate education programs in biomedical informatics is because if you put a bunch of doctors and a bunch of computer science scientists in the same room, you will not get good products that meet the needs of the clinicians. Clinicians don't even know how to describe what they want, and they may not know what they want because they don't have those intuitions yet. Uh, they, they don't know what's possible. They're not in touch with the technology or the underlying software models. But the culture of medicine and of patient care uh, and of workflow issues in, in practice, et cetera, those are just foreign concepts to people trained in computer science and engineering. Uh, these differences aren't nearly as important for biomedical engineers because in biomedical engineering, you're kind of more focused on a device construction. You don't have to have that same. We're, we're affecting the, every, the thinking and the workflow and the processes of an organization, not just of an individual often. So informatics has, has especially big challenges to find ways to bridge. And one of the best ways is to train a cadre of people who really do know both well. Now, does that mean you have to be a clinician, a physician, or a nurse before you can be a good biomedical informatician? I don't think so. But you do need to come out of your training program as a new kind of health professional. You need to think of yourself as a health professional if you're going to work in clinical settings, even if you haven't been formally trained. So we have to teach them a lot about health and about the culture of medicine and the culture of hospitals, and ambulatory clinics. And we've, we've created courses over the years to actually take non-physician, non-medical student type people in a graduate training program in informatics and to, to literally give them a whole series of experiences in clinical settings. And the only downside of that is that about 
20 percent of them decide to quit and go to medical school because they get so excited about medicine when you do that. <laughs> um, so having having said that, uh, if you look at that 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 article in Jamia last year that I mentioned, um, uh, it's it not only defines the field and talks about the various terms uh, that we were just discussing a moment ago, but it also it's it's fundamentally there to provide a uh, 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 the core competencies for people who have graduate degrees, masters or PhD degrees in biomedical informatics. What should they know? And you will find in there a lot of stuff about this acculturation issue and the need to really uh, feel like they're part of the, of the medical world. And frankly, I personally believe this is one of the reasons why experiments to put biomedical or health informatics programs in engineering schools have been quite unsuccessful. They don't have that same immersion in the culture of medicine. And so most of the programs, if you look around the world, are in medical schools or health science universities. Um, all right, so there are efforts to define the core competencies. Are things getting any better? Well, I'm actually seeing real progress, at least in this country. I don't mean that we've reached nirvana yet, but, uh, but things are getting better. So what do I, what, what, what's the evidence? First, more and more medical schools are actually integrating informatics into their curriculum. Uh, and I know this is happening in some other countries too, but they're not just adding a course, you know, two weeks in the third year to learn everything you need to know about informatics. That doesn't work. We know that it doesn't work because that's how they have tried to teach biostatistics to medical students. And we all know just about how much statistics the typical physician knows. Uh, so you can't do it that way. And we've seen great examples of how informatics concepts are now being integrated throughout all the years of medical school with exposures both in clinical settings. The question is, you still, because most of the faculty can't teach informatics, you have to find ways to get the informatics knowledgeable faculty into the various locations where they're trained to have some classroom experience, some project work. Uh, we're finding now that, for example, several medical schools have introduced a requirement that when you learn how to do physical examination and take a history, that you must also write your note on a computer uh, using one of the EHR software packages so that you're learning as a medical student about the interaction with, the, with an EHR. Um, I've written about this. That I have an article in 2010 in the Journal of the American Medical Association basically calling for more education of health professionals and especially physicians regarding informatics and arguing why that's an important part of being a 21st century physician because uh, I really think it is. Uh, and it helps when you write something like that to be able to say, look, I am a physician and I know I, that I need this stuff in order to be an effective physician. Uh, the second thing, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, uh, but some of us in this country are totally stunned that organized medicine has recently approved a brand new subspecialty of clinical informatics, formally approved by the American Board of Medical Specialties. So this the ABMS as it's called. They uh, there was a big process. Amy was very involved. I got personally involved trying to make the case that there were physicians who, instead of doing a fellowship in cardiology after they did internal medicine or nephrology or something, would like to do clinical informatics as their subspecialty training because that's the kind of work they want to do in the hospital. They want to take care of patients. They're going to be general internists maybe, but they also want to. Uh, to uh, work with, as a clinical informatics person, say a chief medical information officer, these kinds of roles that are increasingly being accepted in large healthcare systems. Uh, but it's obvious you don't need to be an internist. You could be a pediatrician or a radiologist or uh, a surgeon, any, any field, and still want to do clinical informatics. And so the other thing that makes this amazing is that when the American Board of Medical Specialties approved this new subspecialty, they also said, you can do it regardless of your primary specialty. You can be any kind of doctor who's boarded in, in any of the fields, and there are 24 different boards that, that are part of the American Board of Medical Specialties. And no matter what your primary field is, you can be a radiation oncologist, but you, your subspecialty can be clinical informatics. So that board exam is going to be given for the first time this fall, in October. Uh, Amy is 
I'm, and the reason I have to leave right after this is to take a train down to the very first board review course that Amy is offering in the Washington, D.C. area for people who want to take their boards and prove their competency as clinical informatics experts. Uh, there are formal fellowships being created that will have to be accredited by the same group that accredits residency programs and fellowships in all the other clinical fields. Uh, and I can't think of anything that's, that's more likely to change the kind of perception of informatics in organized medicine and, the, and our colleagues in hospitals and the like than to know that this is now an accepted specialty for physicians. Uh, so I'm pretty optimistic and excited about this change and it may help with exactly the issues you've been talking you were asking about in your question. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much because I am a stronger I am a strong supporter of this whole idea of um, what we call here in Brazil medical residences or multi-professional residences that are fellowships in health informatics. Uh, I think that this is something that uh, it's very good to know that now it exists in the U.S. because this is a good justification for us to start promoting that here in Brazil <laughs> in other countries as well. Of course, we understand that the, that the U.S. is one of the leaders in this field. And I think that the fellowship would be a good place where we can create this person that will be able to do the translation as we were talking about. Thank you very much. It's very good to, to hear you supporting an idea. I think it's the first time that I'm talking about that in public, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I felt motivated. <laughs> the other thing that I would like to address, unfortunately, before I leave, because I start to give classes in 20 minutes, and it's about decision support. Um, some weeks ago, we had Professor Wyatt here, and it was very interesting because we had the, a very good discussion about about the principles of decision support systems. And he and I agreed that um, there is this mind, this this mainstream conception that for me is not being very good to make the, the decision support system discipline evolve, that is some certain automatic association between decision support and neural networks. You know, you talk about the word and people, oh, neural networks, immediately. Like that was the only way for you to uh, develop a decision support system. And you go, you, you go to the scientific literature and, you know, I think that the majority of, of applications uh, are somehow based on neural networks. And I think that there is confusion between what's the purpose of a neural network. And I think that you can use this kind of model to generate some parameters, but, um, uh, it, you know, it's, it's mentioned as this panacea for the clinical decision support system area, and that doesn't make me feel comfortable. Um, and, um, and, and I think that because I am a supporter of, of decision support uh, systems that are based on rules, uh, uh, we are we are developing a decision support system for detection of epidemics at the point of care, and we are seriously considering using CLIPS. Um, and uh, I think that what, what's required, and I I am missing a paper or some kind of documentation about it that try to tries to break the misconception about this automatic association between uh, rules-based decision support and deterministic models. And because I think that this is, this is another, you know, um, mainstream, um, um, I don't know, mindset uh, when, when you talk about the, this area. And I think that that should, that should change. So I actually, I would like to, to hear a little bit about, uh, you know, um, your opinions about the fundamentals of uh, what is this? What is this? This big picture?
nature of the clinical decision support systems and what are what do you think is the the you know the most updated uh, um, technology that can be used for that well very interesting question I, I actually uh, watched some of that I, I, I didn't join the hangout but I did watch some of that session with Jeremy Wyatt so I remember your uh, your interaction with him uh, and the questions that were raised well look I mean if I thought that uh, first I haven't heard anybody claim the neural networks are a panacea if you're hearing that that may be a localism in Brazil I don't know but <laughs> I think I think uh, uh, neural nets uh, uh, how can I say this? Well, they're not very transparent, right? Mm -hmm. And I happen to believe that uh, decision support requires some transparency or else you'll never have any, any reason to have trust or faith in it. So, you know, I, I believe that back when I did MICE and that's why we did MICE in the way we did. And its ability to explain and give you insight into its reasoning seemed to be a pretty important part of it. And there's uh, there, there, there's a black box aspect to neural networks that uh, um, that clearly can't satisfy that need. Now, on the other hand, if neural nets were suddenly just doing a wonderful bang-up job of of diagnosis, which is probably more likely than they'd be used for um, uh, therapy selection or something like that, uh, we wouldn't be questioning this maybe as much. But we haven't seen huge success, successes with neural net applications in diagnostic medicine either. Uh, so I'm kind of uh, I'm curious about it. Now, I, w one thing you said that really got me was the suggestion that rule-based systems are somehow or another necessarily deterministic. <laughs> because almost every medical problem to which you apply them is not deterministic, cannot be deterministically uh, uh, assessed. And so uncertainty management with rule-based systems is not a new idea. I mean, I, that's what we were doing in the 1970s, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, the certainty factor model that we developed for Mycin has been heavily used. Even when they don't use our rule-based shell, uh, they still use the certainty factor model as a way of trying to deal with uncertainty in rule-based reasoning. And in fact, the only time I got involved personally with doing some neural net research is with someone who convinced me that we ought to try to use the certainty factor model as a weighting function in neural net calculation. Uh, and it worked pretty well, you know, for their tests and, and training sets uh, and, uh, you know, convinced me again that there was really something to that, um, that, uh, that model of uncertainty management. Although I must acknowledge that I've had students subsequently who are such pure Bayesians that anything that doesn't look Bayesian bothers them. And the certainty factor model is not a purely Bayesian model, although we tried to explain why we couldn't use a Bayesian model in, uh, in mice and in subsequent rule-based systems. Uh, but, uh, but now with belief networks and the like, belief networks, that's another matter. That's not neural networks. And I think belief net technology is being well demonstrated, have broad applicability, is being well used in biology too, not just in clinical settings. So, Uncertain, you know, uncertainty in AI as a topic and as a workshop and a meeting and, and as an ongoing area of discourse and study, it's still an important area. Uh, but um, I think that explicitly representing the semantics of a domain is a much more attractive way. It doesn't need to be rule based, but explicit representation of the semantics of a domain. So ontology based reasonings of the sort that many systems nowadays do. But we really understand the basis for the recommendations or the interpretations that come out the other end of the process. And, and that's what you can't do with neural nets. I think, I think neural nets is ways of trying to simulate vision and automobiles, uh, you know, or something like that. These are totally, totally reasonable ways to use that neural net technology. But medical diagnosis, you know, offering advice to clinicians, I don't think it will ever make sense. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. I'll make good questions. You want to follow up on that quickly? I know you've got to go, but okay. <laughs> Dr. Shortliff. Um... Thank you very much. And sorry that I can't stay till the end. It was, uh, you know, excellent.
extremely educational for me. And uh, well, now I, ha I gotta go because I need to give classes. So goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Luciana. <clears throat> A question that I have, uh, and I, I don't want to focus too much on this, but you, you kind of mentioned it here. The underlying semantics, uh, an interest of mine is in the longitudinal care of patients and the temporal importance of, of health care events, well, life events, social, uh, you know, work history, all those things that have happened throughout a patient's life. I know that they affect the current health status of an individual and therefore can affect the future health status of an individual. I, I'm not a physician myself, but I have been privileged to uh, be in some environments like you were talking about, bringing in engineers and computer science people into the clinical setting. So I have an appreciation for the, the workflow and stuff and the interaction. But there seems to be in the, let's say the information systems area, a lack of understanding of the importance of retaining that information in a temporal context so that it can be re-examined in that, well, in that context. Uh, what are your thoughts on the importance of that in the longitudinal patient record? Well, I, I, there's just so many examples in medicine where temporal reasoning is crucial uh, and it's it was identified early on in the AI systems of the 70s and 80s as being an area where no more research had to be done. Uh, I remember that we had very kludgy ways of trying to represent and reason about um, the time course of symptoms or disease in mice in itself. And then it became uh, very much an important thing in the oncology system I was mentioning where you know, how quickly your counts drop after you get chemotherapy, the time course of their response, this kind of thing became very important to understand those, those temporal relationships. Uh, it affected your ability to predict when people would have their nadir counts or their lowest counts and, and therefore be most at risk of infection, uh, most compromised from a immunologic perspective. Uh, and there are many examples like that. So I fully agree about the importance of temporal reasoning and the need to keep time stamping and to be able to reason about things based upon what co-occurred, what came first rather than later, uh, all those kinds of relationships among events. Now, having said that, there are a lot of people who have been working on the problem. And I think this is an area where we're seeing some really solid research results. Um, uh, in the early days, most of the focus was on how to try to make sure that time was represented in a real way in the database. Just how best to provide time stamping and that was a time uh, in the way we actually stored data. Sort of assuming that if you did that well, then later you could start to worry about the issue of how to reason about it. Uh, subsequently, we've seen um, um, great work on, on how to abstract high-level concepts from a bunch of data over time. So this was the period during which uh, the, the tumor was growing. <laughs> right. Uh, which may not be explicitly stated in the record, but that may be important to know. When was it taking off? When, you know, and you may be able to infer that from a lot of individual data points. So uh, I'm thinking of um, uh, the work of uh, a guy named Amar Das. Uh, who's a psychiatrist, MD, PhD in biomedical informatics. Uh, from Israel, Yuval Shahar, who's worked in this area a lot. Um, and there, so there's a, there's a literature. I would say that, that, that the, um, the practical applications have been in areas outside of medicine to this day. An awful lot of work has been medically motivated. But as with Meissen, I would say we had a bigger impact in the short term outside of medicine that we did in medicine and because of the challenges of actually implementing those kind of systems for partly for reasons of workflow that I mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, but I, so I, I totally agree with the notion that, that time and temporal reasoning and, and recording time and, and knowing that you have to be able to uh, reason about how time affects a given individual patient. Uh, and, my, and I might add, uh, not all the time stamping needs to be on clinical uh, elements 
in many cases, it's equally important to not have the time about what's happening socioeconomically, uh, financially, and the like uh, to the individual because those uh, those may be very important both for an individual's clinical care but also for the public health large population analyses you may want to do. So that gets into the issue of merging data from multiple sources, uh, you know, geographical information systems, and, and others that we don't normally think of as being part of the EHR. And the area where we're getting that in spades right now is in uh, is in personalized medicine and the question of how much genetic information needs to be made part of the electronic health record. It's a very interesting set of questions there. A little different, but there are temporal aspects to that as well. Right. And my one of my key interests in the, the temporal aspects is what was known in medicine about this condition when that patient was treated at a specific time in the past. Because to me, that's an important aspect is it, it may be, you know, a, a future decision may need to be made on what knowledge there was in medicine at the time this patient was treated. Was it correct, incorrect? Could it have been better? You know, and it seems to me that quite often physicians, if they don't have that temporal uh, context at that point in time, they may not make the best decision today. Uh, I, I use an example of if you were born in the 50s or 60s, was your mother given whatever the drug was that, you know, for morning sickness that caused lots of problems later on, you know, people in her 40s and 50s, you know, those kind of things. To me, that is the, the temporal thing that makes, you know, the biggest difference. Uh, great. I mean, I think time is very important in many ways, but that's certainly one of them. Yeah. Well, I know that you have to catch a train here very shortly and need to run. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for spending time. Real quick again, uh, anyone, uh, Dr. Levine is kind of in and out. Uh, anyone, uh, Jean, do you have any questions? Anything? Dr. Shorliff, thank you so much for spending time with us and taking an hour out of your day and uh, an hour plus uh, with the preparation needed and everything. Have a great trip down to D.C. Okay. And uh, again, thanks so much to the panel and uh, always a great session. Next week we'll have uh, Professor Arturo Z Ziviani. He's at the Institute of Science and Technology in Petropolis, Brazil. It's really LNCC. Uh, he works with the medicine assisted by com scientific computing and he's a networking specialist, wide, uh, large networking type uh, information, so should be a good show again next week. Everybody take care. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.